Hey everybody, welcome to another Hot Routes episode. Matthew Collar and Marcus Whitman here on the That Franchise Guy channel. And the reason that I'm introing the show and not Marcus is because he is slowly dying of a cold. <laughs> as every as everyone gets though, every single person in Minnesota has their first winter cold. So welcome to winter time, Marcus. And uh, what a time to record after two Monday night football games. Please, Roger. Give us two Monday night football games all the time. What an insane evening with Tommy DeVito going off, leads a game-winning drive against your Packers. And then I flip over the channel, and I think, all right, I'll just watch the end of this game. It's over anyway. The last time I saw the score bug, Miami was up by two touchdowns with three minutes to go, so nothing to see here. But I'll check, and it was worth checking. Give Mike Vrabel the credit, the two-point conversion. Will Levis the comeback. What a night. It was an amazing night of football, Marcus. How about that? On a in a year of just horrible primetime games, too. I I love it. I, I do wish we had a little bit of a split, you know, like 5:30, 7:30, something like that. It was it would have been nice like when when halftime happened to be able to flip over and watch the other game, but they were both at halftime at the same time. Um, but just a little constructive feedback on, yeah, like you said, was Otherwise, uh, a fantastic night, unless you were a Packers fan. Of course, of course. Jordan Love now is a bust. Last week, he was uh, going to have a bust in Canton, but now he's just a bust. It is really funny about how we ride that roller coaster, right? Like with quarterbacks that we're unclear on, the most fascinating thing in football is a quarterback that can be debated on a week to week basis. And so now Tommy DeVito obviously is great. And uh, the Giants should go forward with him as the franchise QB and uh, the Packers should now tank again. I mean, it's, it's, it's really funny about just how we've gone back and forth, but what was your assessment on, on what happened last night to Jordan love? Was it the national media curse? Cause it seems like every time that a quarterback becomes that center of discussion, like, Oh, he's made it. He's the man like Josh Dobbs, maybe here in Minnesota, then instantly that player seems to fall off. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think he's definitely kind of like a, a victim of like the big swings, right? Like he, everyone's got their eyes on him. It's a very fascinating storyline to begin with, but he had the four week stretch where he did kind of play. Like I would say he looked in the first half of the game last night where he just really was, you know, a bad decision in there. And the biggest thing of all is the inaccurate throws really showed up last night. Um, but then, yeah, you have the big swings of the positives. So you get people like me taking victory laps on how good he looks. And, you know, ESPN's running the, you know, Aaron Andrews interviews like he's made it. And yeah, it's just <laughs> you're going to get these big swings. And he's just a polarizing player in general based on his play style. Um, I, I do think, you know, when he's playing well, I didn't see a whole lot of the Jordan Love haters coming out on Twitter. But the second he throws an interception, I'm getting tagged like 15 times. Like, wow, Jordan Love sucks. He turns around in the second half, I thought played much better and settled down. Um, you, you obviously don't love to see the accuracy issues show back up. But that's something that even I've talked about, you know, on the show and stuff is like, that's very well possible that it might happen. And, and it did. Um, the interception was was really kind of the one bad decision he made all night that showed in the first half. Um, and then a fumble came on a rushing play, which you don't love to see, but that's not really like a quarterback thing that you're really projecting forward. So um, I'm I'm still pretty optimistic about how he's looked uh, overall and where the Packers sit in the playoff picture too. So, you know, they, they got to stomach the loss and bounce back, but uh, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be panicking um, necessarily about, about the Packers. And I'm, I'm certainly not. Yeah, I mean, also the Giants defense has shown a capability to do this to quarterbacks at times. I mean, I wouldn't call them like, uh, you know, the Lawrence Taylor, Bill Parcells Giants defense, but on a week to week basis, they can have a good day. And I also have started to think of some, some of these quarterbacks, which is going to transition into our first topic uh, in distribution for like, think about the distribution of games, right? Where Tom Brady his distribution, if you were charting it out, is probably going to be mostly graded by PFF above 80 and sometimes above 90. And then there's 160 thrown in there. And over a 17-game season, Tom Brady in his prime would probably give you 14 great games, two men, and one real stinker. 
Whereas Jordan Love right now, it might be nine really good games and six thinkers mm -hmm. and one or two mid game, right? Like that's, that's who he is right now. And that could change as the receivers improve, as he becomes more comfortable, as time goes on, or that could never improve. Uh, because I mean, Carson Wentz was kind of like this, like Carson Wentz, uh, can show us a quarterback that can either be great or terrible on a week to week basis. And even when he was at his best, it would sort of be that way. So there's lots of different distributions, um, kind of like a baseball player who's fairly consistent, uh, versus one that has a very hot May and a terrible June and what I like the, they're all over the place. So I, I've started to think of quarterbacks this way and that's what makes it difficult because when they look good, it looks so good. And when they look bad, it looks so bad. Tommy DeVito last night. So good. I mean, he's running all over the place. Uh, he, I don't know if people know he ran a sub four, six, like he's pretty quick. He's making plays, but just a couple weeks ago, Tommy DeVito threw for like 80 yards in a game that they lost by 30 points. So let's talk about all these backup quarterbacks. I mean, this is the year of the backups, backup, backup playing in the <laughs> NFL and who we think, who we think is good. I don't know where you want to start with that. Like who there have been some really good performances by backup quarterbacks or even Joe Flacco randomly showing up and playing well this week for the Cleveland Browns. How are you sorting your way through one of the strangest quarterback years that I can ever remember? Yeah. And I think this is the week where I've, I've fully embraced this season where, you know, one out of three teams has a backup quarterback and I will say just at large, it's changed my perspective on the reality that a backup quarterback can win you a football game. Um, and I think I think two two things there, like we're just seeing more backups now. So we're we're you know viewing these backups playing well. But I do think at large, like the depth and talent of quarterbacks entering the league nowadays is different than maybe 10, 10 years ago, where most backups step in and it's like you don't even have a semblance of a passing game. I think a lot of these guys, you know, they played the 11 on 11s. They played, you know, college offenses are much more similar to pro style offenses now. So you can see these guys like Gardner Minshew, who played in a spread offense in college and Tommy DeVito and um, Jake Browning, you know, played in the Pac-12 spread offense. So you're seeing these guys much more comfortable in the NFL at large. Um, but in terms of like on an individual basis, who's good, uh, the way I'm kind of sorting it in my mind is like a who could actually like maybe win a playoff game or like keep their team in some semblance of real competition. And then B have any of these guys actually made cases to be starters next season. And there some, some answer is, you know, some of them have an answer of yes to one, no to the other. Um, like for example, Gardner Minshew to me with the Colts, probably not a guy that um, is going to win a playoff game for them this year. But I do think he's a starter in the NFL, like 100 percent. He's right there with like the, a Baker Mayfield or, you know, some of these guys. And, and you made the case last year where a lot of teams will look at a guy like Minshew and say, you know, he what, what what's the point? Right. Like, where is this going to go? Um, but I still think there's a lot of like prospects like like the Falcons wasting their time with Desmond Ritter is like the prime example like put Gardner Minshew on the Falcons this year, they're running away with the NFC South. So to me, that's where, where Gardner sits. Uh, the, the one guy that I don't necessarily think is going to be a starter next year, but I'm very fascinated. on like, could he actually have sort of like a Nick Foles playoff run is Jake Browning where the Bengals have really a nice setup around them. The, the entire team is getting hot and healthy at the right time just outside of the quarterback position. He's got playmakers. He's got a defense playing well. And he's he's one of these kind of, I don't know, Case Keenum-esque, Nick Foles-esque backups where he's had to learn the position the right way because he he's not a great runner. He doesn't have a great arm. But if he plays on time and can, can kind of play point guard, could the Bengals actually make some noise here? And I, I didn't take them seriously going into the Jags game a week ago. I picked the Colts to win this week, um, but he really hasn't slipped up yet. And I'm starting to buy into the, uh, the Jake Browning narrative here. And so this is the hard thing is Jake Browning has played two good games in a row, which means that he must be good. 
And I also saw Josh Dobbs play two good games in a row and then completely fall apart. Now with Jake Browning, you make a great point that this is somebody who is really developed in that offense, that he arrives there in 2021 and was able to sit behind Joe Burrow and develop and master that offense so he can come in and try to play the role of Joe Burrow as best as he possibly can. And I did see a little bit of like, well, is it actually Zach Taylor and the receivers? And um, no, no, it's not. Uh, And we'll probably find that out eventually uh, because I was also looking at his numbers as far as what Zach Taylor has been doing. And I think he's been doing an amazing job of play actions, screens, like getting the ball quickly into the hands of Jamar Chase to Mm -hmm. limit how much you're really asking Jake Browning to do. And that's not a criticism of Jake Browning. Like he's executing all of those things. Those plays count. You run a play action, you throw to a wide open receiver. You don't have to give it back. That's one of my things with uh, Brock Purdy. He throws to wide open receivers. What do you want him to do? Apologize? Like, (laughs) oh, I'm sorry. I delivered the ball perfectly to Debo Samuel and he ran 70 more yards. I guess I, you know, Joe Montana should say he's sorry for throwing to uh, Jerry Rice all those times and winning the Super Bowl. I guess he should throw his ring in the San Francisco Bay because the receivers were open. It's like a it's a silly <laughs> argument to me. Uh, but the, the the question for me about somebody like Jake Browning is when you run into a circumstance where you do need him to be a drop back passer, if there are games that are close, if there are games that you know he's got to go Uh, come back from down 10 points or something, is he actually going to be able to put it on his shoulders? And the answer is probably no. But that Cincinnati team, as you may remember from our early season discussions, they were my pick to win the Super Bowl because look at that roster. And and, and I think their coaching is extremely good and their their weapons are fantastic. And so I, I think what we see, what's really, really revealed when you have backup quarterbacks in, is how strong is your structure? Like how how strong is the supporting cast to your quarterback? And I think with some of these guys, we should ask like, all right, okay, Tommy DeVito's not going to be a franchise quarterback, more likely than not. I don't want to count out anything because Brady was a sixth round pick and Kurt Warner was bagging groceries, but I, you know, more likely than not. But how much do you need to get that person to play consistently as far as your supporting cast. And what we really see is just how much the supporting cast matters when you have a a player come in that is not as physically gifted and just has to try to work around it. Or in Joe Flacco's case, someone who's on his couch and is really old and Kevin Stefanski's having him run the boots over and over again and find open receivers. And that's, that's where I think we can actually learn from a lot of these quarterbacks. Uh, it's very hard to pin down, like, is Jake Browning this week going to face Brian Flores and melt down and throw three interceptions? Uh, maybe. Uh, you could definitely see that. Uh, but what we really see here, I think, is coach's ability to adapt and adjust to that quarterback. And then I think we also see sometimes there's nothing you can do with some of the ups and downs. This week was a great week for a lot of backup quarterbacks, but we also see Josh Dobbs get benched. Aiden O'Connell put up zero points. And if you told me that Aiden O'Connell threw for 300 yards next week, I'd be like, okay, because th- that that's the league. I mean, I, I do, I do agree with what you're saying that, you know, some of these quarterbacks come in and especially if they can have time to develop, They have the physical talent and they've probably been through a pipeline of quarterback coaching and individual coaching and everything else since they were younger and have a better chance to be in there uh, than, you know, maybe backups of the past, a lot of backups of the past that that would have struggled. At the same time, I think that as we go forward, what we're going to see is if your starting quarterback is healthy, you're going to go deep in the playoffs. And at the end of the day, there might not be any teams without starting quarterbacks that are going into the final eight teams or something. Yeah, very well said. And the idea of of a guy like Browning being in the same system for so long, I think is, is really just kind of a a fun case study um, in terms of like holding, holding on to these guys, even if they haven't shown anything yet, because it might reach a point where they're just going to be able to give you 70% of your starting quarterback. If he's stylistically pretty similar um, I, I did want to talk a little bit more about Joe Flacco too, though, because he is a guy that's done it and I watch him play and I'm like, Joe Flacco looks kind of good, man. Like 
maybe even better than I remember him looking in Baltimore, at least the last couple of years. Like the way the ball is zipping out of his arm, I'm like, that dude's 38 years old. Like, holy hell. Like, he honestly still probably has one of the five strongest arms in the league, just the velocity on some of these passes. Um, you're seeing him play like on time too. Like, it's not just the play action boots. Like, they're hitting like in breakers on time. He's actually got an established chemistry with Elijah Moore because they were together um, with the Jets last year. Uh, it's a very similar system that Flacco ran with the Jets last year. So he's just kind of stepped in and like given the Browns the best quarterback play they've had since Baker Mayfield was good there. And it's I'm I'm very interested. And I I feel like, like you said, it's just going to fall off at some point. But what if it doesn't like this is quickly turning into one of the more interesting storylines in the NFL right now is Joe Flacco. Are you seeing the same thing? A, a little bit. I mean, so the thing about Joe Flacco is like the last few years when he's had to play, he has not been very good, but he did have that one crazy good game for the Jets that he won last year and everyone went Flacco's back and then lost like three in a row. Uh, mm. And again, sort of the nature of the ups and downs. And it always feels like pouring cold water because everyone really gets excited when a backup quarterback comes in yeah. and then you're like, okay, all right, let, like the Minnesota weather, just wait and it'll change. Um, that it is what often happens. However, if there's one of these backups and one of these teams that ha has a backup in that you would actually be scared to play in a playoff game, it is absolutely the Cleveland Browns. I mean, I think what we saw from Josh Dobbs and Nick Mullins the other day tells you that even with Justin Jefferson coming back, there's going to be a cap on that offense. And as good as their defense is, Winning a playoff game in Dallas, even in Detroit, is going to be pretty darn difficult if you have to match a team, you know, points for points with those backup quarterbacks. But Flacco, knowing the talent that he has, knowing the experience that he has, and the setup there, and the coaching there to go along with their defense, is it possible that Joe Flacco in two playoff games gets really hot, hits a bunch of those shots that he's known for? throws a Hail Mary that maybe a Denver Broncos player jumps a little early and it goes over his head and goes for a touchdown in uh, 2012 and they win a game. Like, <laughs> I, I, I wouldn't want to see him. I truly would not want to see Joe Flacco because you have seen in the past this man get blazing hot in the playoffs and the fact that his arm is still very much live. I mean, you mentioned it. There is zip on that fastball and – he doesn't really have to play different than he ever did because it's not like he was ever mobile in the first place. Like yeah. he pretty much is just always going to be a pocket passer. So he is really the only one as fun as these storylines have been of these backup quarterbacks. He's really the only one where I would say, yeah, I think you actually need to be worried about him. I, I think Jake Browning is going to have a tough time like against playoff defenses and things like that. Uh, and, and that's been really fun for me to see because I covered Jake while he was here, but yeah, I, I think if he had to win multiple playoff games, I'd be like, I don't know if I could see that Flacco though. I, I definitely could. Yeah, I agree. Um, the, the only other note I have here is, is Tommy DeVito. I, I do think, I mean, he, he looks and feels like a really good backup and like, you know, the mobility, his, his elusiveness out of these sacks, he has been mostly avoiding mistakes. I mean, that was the big thing uh, kind of as a Packers fan, like going against him last night, you're just waiting on the mistake, the backup quarterback, the air mills, a throw over the middle or forces a ball into double coverage. It just, it just didn't happen. Um, and if, it, I think he's been doing that um, for the most part since he stepped in and he's in a unique situation where he has, Obviously, he's got the fans behind him. He's got the whole freaking city and East Coast behind him. He's got all the Italians like myself behind behind him repping the Tommy Cutlets. Um, but, you know, Daniel Jones is coming off an ACL injury, so he might actually have a chance to start like week one or week two. And then, you know, what if he keeps playing well next year after a full offseason with the team? I don't think it's going to happen, but um, definitely, definitely fascinating. <laughs> I did have the thought uh, because I, his athleticism gives him a chance in my mind. Mm -hmm. Like the, there's not much as far as like real arm strength there. And he's going to have to throw underneath stuff uh, and so forth. And eventually, you know, teams will probably be able to manage against that uh, with just the lack of, you know, pure arm talent. But um, he may have played them out of like Jaden Daniels or something. <laughs> and yeah, that's kind of funny to think about. Cause I mean, who would be better than Jaden Daniels for, Brian Dable 
right? And so they're mm-hmm. winning these games and it's Tommy DeVito and it's a fun story and everyone's making fun of how his agent looks like something out of the Sopranos and everything. And that's, that's all fun. It's like, it's all fun and games until you play yourself right out of drafting a great quarterback. So yeah. uh, we'll see how that ends up playing out that I think that last night may end up being the peak, but I agree with you though. If you show you can do it and you can win a game, I had a lot of Taylor Heineke vibes with him. Like, yeah. All right. This guy's got athleticism enough that, that you can do it. Uh, let's talk about a, a couple of real contenders though, in the Philadelphia Eagles and the Dallas Cowboys. Now that game was not that compelling because the Dallas Cowboys were dominant. And I think that people have been very hesitant to declare the Cowboys, possibly the best team in the NFL or on equal footing or close to San Francisco. I think it's fair to say San Francisco is a shade better, but they have won now 15 straight games in Dallas. They are blowing people out Their their mm-hmm. point differential. Let me uh, pull up their What's their point differential at this point? It's gotta be, it's gotta be ridiculous. The amount of times that they've put up 40 plus points. Yeah. They are plus plus one eighty eight point differential, yeah. which is number one in the national football league. And I'm not saying the Cowboys are underrated. Okay. This is not my point. No one has ever underrated the Cowboys. If you turn on ESPN, the Cowboys are being talked about constantly. I get that. But the way that they ended in the playoffs the last couple of years has made it so irrelevant what happens to them in the regular season that I don't think we have appreciated how much better they have gotten. And I, Mike, if Mike McCarthy's not the coach of the year, I don't know who deserves to be because when he gets rid of Kellen Moore, everyone's like, Oh, dope. Because everyone just lines up to tell Mike McCarthy how stupid he is all the time. And yet all he does is win. He's got one of the greatest winning percentages of all time. And he's won a ton in Dallas in the regular season. But I I think we do need to stop and point out that those teams that were very good over the last couple of years, I don't think they're as good as what Dallas has brought to the table this year. And I view them much more on equal plane with San Francisco for the best team in the NFL rather than San Francisco being far ahead of them. How do you look at it? I still think San Fran is a little further ahead. I I just think they're a little bit more complete Um, when you mix in. Like I I agree. McCarthy's doing a good job, but he's not what Kyle Shanahan is in terms of having answers for every type of defense and the run game. You know, the Cowboys have a pretty good run game, but I'm not like terrified of their run game. Um, but the Niners can do beat you in any way. And I, I also think the Niners defense um, is just a little bit more physical, a little better against the run. Um, so I just I do think they have like a couple different answers to other problems that different teams will present to them, for lack of a better way to put it. Um, but I do agree that the Cowboys, it's almost like a 1A, 1B, and then after that, which I think is what you're saying. But I think the A and B are a little bit further apart for me than maybe for you. But Uh, I mean, definitely they have, they have blown me away for me. The big difference though, is the way Dak's playing. Um, And any Cowboys fan that tries to tell you, this is who Dak has always been. You're full of crap. Like, no, it's not. This is an MVP level quarterback here. Completely changes how you feel about the Cowboys, how you feel about Dak. Uh, Maybe changes how you feel about their future. I've compared him to Matt Ryan though, who's, you know, had one big year and then went back to that guy. But for what he's doing right now, how hot he is, how well he's seeing the field, um, that changes everything. And I've always seen him closer to a Kirk Cousins, a guy that isn't going to have a lot of answers against top defenses in the playoffs. And I think he's playing at a level right now, as we're now a month away from the playoffs, that he's set up to change that perspective on him. Um We'll see, though, right? Like, I still think there is a little bit of the whole, like, can they do it in January thing about it. Um, But when you look at the efficiency that Dak's playing with, I really think it it elevates them to to that level. Just some numbers to back that up. So Dak Prescott has a career high in big time throw percentage per PFF, which is, you know, throws that are deemed... um, above and beyond usually you know 20 plus yards or with a hand in your face like elite quarterback throws a career high in big time throw percentage at 6.6 percent his career average is 4.4 
So about a third less than that. He's only once been above 5%. That was at 5.2 in 2020. So he is elevating the offense with huge throws, not just being more week to week as more of like a point guard style, which I think he's been for a large part of his career. He is really pushing the ball downfield. Um, and then the the turnover stuff as well. I mean, think about what people were saying about Dak coming into the year, led the, the league in interceptions last year. I uh, had a career high in turnover worthy play percentage last year at 4%. He's, he's over half less than that this year, 1.5% turnover worthy plays, which is a, a remarkable mark that just shows you how in control he is, how, how, you know, he knows what coverages are coming. He's got the best pre-snap processor in the league right now in terms of reading leverage of defenders, knowing where the blitz is coming from, where the ball needs to get to, um, has all of the answers. Um, and the PFF grade itself, uh, which every time you bring up PFF grade, you need to, it feels like you need to say the disclaimer of, I know they're not perfect, but they normally tell a better picture. I mean, he's, he's got the best quarterback grade in the, in the NFL right now, 92.1. He's been a mid to low 80s grade guy uh, throughout his career with just one year over 85. Um, so, you know, he's just on a different plane of existence right now in, in terms of quarterbacking. And it just it completely changes the picture. But he's got to keep it up through the playoffs. Right. Like that's that's the big thing. And, you know, I think that this year can't be understated. And, and I know that the fantasy numbers for Brandon Cooks are not crazy, but he's got 534 yards this year and it's added just one more weapon for him that you have to account for. And everyone knows that Brandon cooks is a legitimate deep threat. And that's something where, even though he's still pushing the ball to CD lamb, who's another guy that I feel like doesn't have the receiver celebrity status in the same way that Tyree kill or Justin Jefferson has. Uh, but I mean, guys got all, you know, almost 1300 yards, already and we've still got a lot of football to play but you know Tyreek is so dominant this year that no one's mentioning CD Lamb but uh th the weapons I think were improved subtly by adding Brandon Cooks there and it's just been a factor for him uh and also you know his chemistry with Jake Ferguson but uh, when you know when comparing them in San Francisco I mean if you go through the numbers you could sort of back up your case back up the Dallas case uh in any way you can but that's why 1a 1b I think is the right description I mean they have 40 more points than San Francisco but if you look at the EPA on offense San Francisco's is a little bit higher you know so you could kind of go back and forth there but you know Dak Prescott Definitely his comfort in that offense has just shot up. And I also think you can't underrate to moving on from Ezekiel Elliott. And it, it, he was sort of the elephant in the room for a few years where it's like, well, we still got to make sure that we're giving it to Ezekiel Elliott enough mm -hmm. times. And this is another thing where it's like some things that McCarthy says online get mocked mercilessly where he was talking about, you know, running too much, I think for Kellen Moore and people were like, what? That's not happening. But running Ezekiel Elliott too much was a real thing. I mean, you were starting out at second and eight a lot of times because you were like, okay, well, he's still on the team. We got to give him the football. And even though Tony Pollard, as to be expected, when you're the main running back, your yards per attempt are going to go down from when you're the, you know, an in and out type of back. Uh, but I think it's been a major factor uh, that you, they can just run when they feel it's appropriate to run rather than thinking, all right, we got to make sure we, we have this guy touch the football. Now on the other side of this, are the Eagles out of this conversation? as the best team in the NFC, because I'm pretty out on them in that way. And a major part of that is just their defense. Like I saw it when I was yep. in Philadelphia against the Vikings, where they let the Vikings come back from down three scores because they couldn't really cover anybody. They have a great defensive line, but their coverage is just a problem. And I also think that when David Carr said that Jalen hurts can't read defenses, it was like, Oh, not this again. That was a terrible argument, but when he was saying that Hertz is banged up and maybe they should play Mariota for a week or two to get him healthy, I actually agreed with him. I mean, I think that Hertz this year has become a better pocket passer than he even was last year or just as good, but he, he is not as much of a threat as he was on the ground. And I think that that's really hurt them. So are you, uh, how are you feeling about the Eagles? Are you think we're overreacting or are you down on them? No, they're definitely in their own 
the the NFC is very segmented in, in my opinion because the Eagles are are definitely between the Cowboys and the Lions and whoever you would put next. But and I, I still think they can get hot and healthy and and still very much win the Super Bowl. So like I don't want to write them off or anything. But yeah, I mean we had four weeks to go here. Like how can you not be concerned? They have a lot of issues compared to the Niners and the and the Eagles. And maybe if they were. It's funny that we're saying saying this now, uh, but maybe if they were in the AFC, we'd be less worried about them. Didn't think we'd be saying that, you know, coming into the year. But, I mean, you made a great point about Jalen Hurts. Those second and ten scrambles are turning into third and six, third and five in, instead of first downs. That's a huge difference. I, you know, I still think Jalen Hurts has his issues as a drop back passer um, in terms of his his pocket movement and decision making within the pocket, like. Not not in terms of the throws he's making, but when he's scrambling, when he's staying in the pocket, taking bad sacks, scrambling too early. He's one of the honestly one of the worst quarterbacks in the league in terms of like knowing how to manage a pass rush, which is why it's so great that he has that offensive line in front of him. And I'm going to get hate for that, but it's just it's just what I see when I watch him play. He's, he's great at a lot of other things. But when when you're not turning those second down scrambles or those those QB designed runs on second down into first downs and all of a sudden you get into third down it just it puts pressure on everybody else in a different way. Um, I think they miss Shane Steichen, the play caller that I watch in Indianapolis that is just money, like knows exactly um, what buttons to push with the RPOs and stuff. That felt like such an unstoppable part of the Eagles last year uh, was they just would force you to decide how you want to defend them. And their run game's not as good. Uh, they're just not as, as much of a fear factor offense. But their offense is still very good. I think you're right about the defense. Also, I think we were too low on Jonathan Gannon um, and and the schemes that he brought to the table. I think he elevated that defensive line uh, with his blitz schemes and um, really got that pass rush after it in a big way late last season that it just doesn't feel that way this year. I I got a lot of hate and pushback. Like uh, mid-June 19th was this tweet where PFF said the Eagles have the best O-line and the best D-line. And I was like, I don't I don't see that with the Eagles D line. I, I like the depth and the talent. and They're definitely a great D line. But compared to like Dallas on the other side of the ball or the Niners, the Eagles don't have that superstar talent, that guy that you must double team or else. And I think you feel that, you know, Hassan Reddick has his splash plays for sure. But there's a lot of dropbacks against that D line where they're covered up, they're blocked. Um, and then you're you're challenging a, a secondary that's aging. And they miss Avante Maddox in the slot. So, yeah, they just they do have a lot of issues, all detailed by us there in about the last five minutes. Um, but they could definitely still be a Super Bowl team. Yeah, no, that's right. And would you be surprised if they got hot? But you're right. They don't have that one person. I mean, Jalen Carter is uh, emerging as being that guy. Um, but more of it's, I don't want to call him a rotational player, but he's not like a 70 snap player. And that's part of their, what, like what they do is rotate guys in. Um, but they don't have the miles Garrett where you're just like all day long. I got to deal with that guy. And that is a problem. Having seen Max Crosby in person this week. Yeah. Oh my God. I <laughs> just it's like a, every play. Level. Right. Every I, I have play. a quick note actually on yeah. Jalen Carter that I forgot yeah. to mention. Everybody crowned him like the replacement to, to Javon Hargrave, like week one, when he goes against a pair of backup day three rookies against the Patriots and had nine pressures and took over the game. That remains by far his best performance on the season, by the way. He had 24 of his 39 pressures this year in the first six games of the season that were against New England, Tampa Bay, Washington, the Rams, and the Dolphins, which are some of the first offensive lines in the league. Since then, he's been an above average player. I wouldn't even say he's been a, a maybe he's been a good player, but he hasn't been close to a great player. Um, And that's been a a huge difference is Hargrave is one of the best, you know, pass rushing interior players in the league. He's been that for the Niners this year and he's on the Niners, not the Eagles. Now it's a big difference. Right. And you know, when you look at, for me, it's the D line is, um, lacking that one guy that maybe used to be Fletcher Cox and now Fletcher Cox can only play so much. And it used to be, I mean, I, I thought Brandon Graham was one of the more underrated players in the NFL, but he only has 282 snaps 
and he's still playing every game. So he's like barely in the game, yeah. making that difference that he used to. And he used to be sort of that driving force. But when I look at their secondary, that's and and the linebacking group as well. Like I know they got Shaq Leonard and we'll see how that works out, but they only have using the PFF grades. They only have one defensive back who is graded higher than 70 by PFF. That's pretty hard to win with. If you have to face Dallas, San Francisco, like these are these elite passing games in the NFL and you are having coverage problems and they've tried to address it, but I think that's just going to be a problem for them going into the playoffs. Uh, let's run through the AFC. Let's go like rapid fire style. The teams that are in the playoffs right now for the AFC and what we think their, their one like fatal flaw is. And of course the, the good transition into this might be just the dolphins. Like what the heck dolphins? What, what, what was even happening? Like to give up that lead last night, that was absolutely wild. And on the final drive, if a quarterback takes a sack at, on a play that is going to end the game, I just am like, how does that even happen with Tua last night? I mean, throwing the ball a million yards in the air, just heaving it up would be better <laughs> than taking a sack on fourth and two uh, when you could potentially kick a field goal to win the game. Uh, but if we want to start at the top here with the one seed Baltimore Ravens, we could just go back and forth like a sentence or two on what we think could be fatal flaws for these AFC teams. So what do you think about Baltimore? Yeah, Baltimore is definitely the hardest one. And uh, they're the one team that I would say probably doesn't have a fatal flaw, but like, I I still think they have a lack of truly elite star power. Um, they have a bunch of B plus players, but do they have a guy that can take over a game and change the numbers and just, you know, if something goes wrong, if you have a, you know, missed field goal or a block punt or, you know, a fumble, Lamar's been fumbling a lot this year. If, if something goes wrong, do you have a guy that can just get you right back on track or give you that big explosive play through the air? I mean, Odell's had a couple this year, but do I count on that compared to like a CD lamb or a Tyreek or some of these elite guys? No. Um, defensively, I think they scheme up their pass rush will really well. Clowney's having a nice fun season. Matabuike is a fun, fun player, but do they have a guy that if you just want to rush for and dial up good coverage on the back end, like do, do they have a, a D line that can get home against the best O lines in the league? I don't know. That, that to me is it. I just don't see the like game wrecking player on the Baltimore Ravens other than maybe Lamar. Um, but I still, and Lamar's having a great year. He's impressed me. I still wouldn't say he's on that, like Josh Allen, elite Mahomes, like Joe Burrow. I still don't think from a down in, down out consistency standpoint, I still don't think Lamar is there. It's, you know, it's a missed throw here or there that, and that's really what it is, is, is just some of the throws that he'll leave short. Um, just from an arm talent perspective is, is just a cut below what you would expect from a truly elite quarterback. But yeah, they definitely are the hardest team to pick like a weakness on. Yeah. I, I think I, I was going to go with Lamar turning the ball over is always a possibility that you could have a game where it's three turnovers from Lamar. Cause he fumbles a couple times and throws one wobbling pass is that he has turned into, in my mind, a very, very, I mean, it didn't, didn't take long for this to happen, but a very, very good passer in the NFL but there's just these moments where the ball comes out looking so ugly and you go up, oh, is it getting picked? And I just looked this up. He has 14 turnover worthy plays and only six picks. And so you're like, is that gap going to close in a playoff game against a really good defense that is, is going to you know cause a fumble, cause an interception, something like that. That's a, and that is a nitpicky concern with one of the world's yeah. greatest football players. Okay. Like very, very much a nitpicky concern. But I, I was going to say the same thing with wide receivers specifically. Uh, the Odell Beckham story has been fun to follow. Seems like he's having a great time playing football. And he's an amazing player. So him coming back is great to watch. And the catch he made, the adjustment in the air mm -hmm. the other day on that deep pass, remarkable. Rashad Bateman is not great. Mark Andrews is out. And I don't know what his status is for coming back potentially by the end of the season. But if, even if he does, you're talking about a banged up Mark Andrews. I don't think a tight end can drive an offense unless it's Rob Gronkowski. And then who else? Like Zay Flowers is a rookie that has, I think, some limitations to his game, though I've been impressed. There is not 
totally right that you said like CD lamb. There's not that one guy where you're just like, uh Oh, we're in trouble. We're down 13 points in the third quarter time. To just pump that dude, the ball and make some plays. Yeah. They really don't have that answer that is undefeatable, which is how I have felt about like Justin Jefferson. Like it's just, what's the answer to Justin Jefferson? There isn't one. Well, there is an answer to the receivers that they have. That's the best I could do. I mean, I think they're the best team in the AFC. So that's kind of the one nitpick Miami. I feel like, uh, somebody I follow put this pretty well, uh, Derek class in QB class on Twitter. If people follow him comes on my show pretty often. And he said, like, if there's anything that happens that throws off the cogs of the machine, if there's a grain of sand in, that falls into the machine and gums it up a little bit that the wheels come off and that, yeah. that is also totally right. If, if the opposing defense has any answer at all, it seems like they can't really function. And I, I wouldn't call it gimmicky because that seems really jerkish to call it gimmicky, but it's like, can it, can it morph? Can it go off schedule? Can it get punched in the face and respond? I don't know that it can. Yeah. I mean, they're like a comedian that has one really good bit, but you know, if you keep telling that bit to the same crowd, you're going to need, you know, a different, a different bit. And they don't really have it right now. It's, you know, it's those two uh, in breaking throws to Tyree kill is really, you know, at the end of the day, that's what it is. And I, I wrote down Tua as my biggest flaw for, for the dolphins. I just like, that's in my heart of heart. I don't feel like he's a quarterback that has a plan B. Like you said, he, he puts the ball in harm's way way too often, whether it's on the ground or through the air. And if they lose a playoff game, I think it's going to be because of him. I, I just, I just do. I, yeah, I think he is capable because of the limitations of arm strength, <clears throat> size, mobility of slowing down. And this has long been the case for pure pocket passers. I mean, it's, it is Jimmy Garoppolo ish at where it's, if it's coming on time and it's a open and it's there and everything else, this man can deliver a tremendous anticipation ball. He can find the open guy, but what's the answer when you have to have somebody do something truly special. And that's the difference. We're only talking through the lens of the super bowl here. Not, are you a great team? Right. And not even, is he a good quarterback? I always thought Jimmy with San Francisco was a really good quarterback. Uh, and I'm going to stick with that. Like, don't apologize for throwing to open receivers thing. But if you're in an AFC championship against the bills and they are hitting you over and over again, like, are you going to be able to find a way like Josh Allen can, uh, with his physical talent? Speaking of which, who wants to say it? The Kansas city chiefs, biggest flaw is lining up offsides. Why can they <laughs> not line themselves up even on the play where Kadarius Tony is offside? the left tackle is playing in the backfield. Like <laughs> what they can't, they can't go on the snap. They can't line up on side. I have never seen a team with a winning record that has shot itself in the foot. The way that the Kansas city has it's, it is truly remarkable that they're eight and five. They cannot catch passes. They get f flagged constantly. I also think yeah. that the refs, this is a theory. The refs heard it early in the season when there were a couple of calls that went Kansas City's way of everyone saying you're playing the Chiefs and the refs, and they have made sure it's gone back the other way. That's just a theory, but that that alignment was not legal. So I don't know, you know, like Mahomes can right. be as mad as he wants. I don't think they could play sound football long enough to go all the way to the Super Bowl. Yeah, I mean, they are the the most toothless offense in, in the league in terms of explosiveness and yeah, I think Mahomes has like two completion, like two true deep completions, like all year. Like they just don't, they don't have the ability to push the ball downfield. They don't trust MVS, rightfully so. And yeah, they have just the biggest mistakes and the biggest moments, and they they have four weeks to clean that up. I mean, they're they're the most straightforward um, Achilles heel, you know, kryptonite answer uh, in the AFC. Um, you know, I think I think the Browns are also pretty clear too. After I say that, uh, quarterback. You know, I like Flacco. I'm interested, but I don't think we really need to spend time on that one. What What about the Jaguars? To you, for me, their their biggest flaw is they still to me feel like what they were last year, where it's like this is a fun a fun deal. They've got talent. They can beat teams when they're they're on. But where's the down in down out consistency, especially through the air? 
they still have way too many miscommunications. Trevor Lawrence threw two interceptions in this game where um, one time to Zay Jones, one time to um, uh, uh, Ridley, where the receiver wasn't where Lawrence was expecting him. Two just game-changing interceptions here in week 14. If that's happening week three, you know, you bring in Ridley, new wide receiver, trying to, you know, weed out the kinks. That's one thing, but for that to still be happening, and that's been every single week, I'm like, Trevor played great, but there was like four mistakes that, you know, held the offense back. It's still happening. And I didn't think Trevor looked banged up or like he was moving well. He had plenty of velocity on his ball. I'm I'm not super worried about the uh, the ankle sprain right now. Um, but to me, it's it's fairly similar to the Chiefs in that they just are making way too many mental mistakes through the air. Yeah, I, I have trouble thinking that you can go deep in the playoffs with the 20th ranked offensive line by PFF. And, mm-hmm. uh, you know, like you said, there's always disclaimers with grades and things like that. But in, in my mind, the offensive line analysis is probably the one you can lean on the most clearly to say, if you are ranked in the bottom third of the league in pass blocking and your expectation is to win four playoff games, I just don't see it happen. I mean, with the, the defensive yeah. lines, the, the blitzing, the creativity, I mean, you are seeing on a week to week basis, these defensive coordinators just get even more and more and more creative in how they create pressure and no quarterback in the league is better when they're pressured than when they're not. I mean, that is always and forever a football fact. So I, that to me is a fatal flaw. Like the other ones like, Oh, is, can Odell Beckham be a number one receiver? Like probably, I mean, probably right. It's just, it's a nitpick. This one is, I don't think you can actually win the super bowl if you have that offensive line. Yeah. And injuries are stacking up there too, which is never, never a good combination. Right, um, right. They were playing yeah. Ezra Cleveland, a career guard at left tackle, and then he got hurt. So they were down to left tackle four. So that's, that's a big part of it for sure. Yeah. And then just to rip through the, the last of them Broncos, I just said lack of dynamism on either side, like a, a, an exaggerated version of what we said about the Ravens. Like, I don't trust the pass rush. They got some solid receivers, but they're not a, they're not an explosive offense. They're not a, a shutdown defense. They're just, they're a solid Solid team. They continue to re- just remind me of the Wisconsin Badgers, uh, like when the Badgers are good. Like never a real threat to like win at all, but a frisky, tough team. Um, and then the the Houston Texans, they're just a year. They're just a year early. They're ahead of their development cycle, and um, injuries are stacking up too. You know, when they're already an underdog team, you can't you can't come out and lose Tank Dell in the last month of the year. You can't lose Nico Collins. It's just you know. They're, they're a year ahead of, of when they're supposed to be good. And then you got Steelers, Colts, Bengals, quarterback. Uh, easy answer there. And then you have the team that is going to win the Super Bowl, the Buffalo Bills, uh, mm-hmm. that uh, they, right. they have, you know, their flaw, it would, would not be surprised. If you didn't know their record and you just knew their roster, like how the, you just watched a couple of games, and didn't see maybe the end, like a punt return or a 59 yard field goal or whatever, you would say this is right up there for the strongest team in the entire AFC. It's mm-hmm. just that where they sit in the playoffs right now, doesn't look that way. And that's hard to convince people of, but they're coming off a really good win. And I would not be shocked at all if they streak to the end and then go into the playoffs as a very, very dangerous team, because it's just, do we really see Pittsburgh and Indianapolis in the playoffs or do we see Cincinnati and Buffalo? Like it's probably going to be Cincinnati and Buffalo. I would think are going to fight their way into the postseason. Uh, but Buffalo, their flaw is they can't close out a game for the most part. Um, unless Kadarius Tony lines up offside, but I, it's, it, I still can't help but think it, when push comes to shove, who's got the quarterback who can make the plays Who's got that number one wide receiver? Who's got that defense? Like they have all those things and Mm -hmm. they have just fallen on their face in some uh, very key moments. Uh, Last thing before we uh, wrap up, I'll have a little, have a little fun here. So we're in uh, mid December now, only 13 days away from Christmas and whatever other holiday you want to celebrate might be currently happening or not. I don't know. December holidays. Anyway, wish lists of things that we want Santa or whomever magical creature delivers presents to you. 
<laughs> uh, bring us. Well, very well what? said, Matthew. <laughs> just want, just want everybody to feel welcome. Okay, that's yes, thing. absolutely, that's, absolutely. Every, everybody should feel welcome. Come one, come all. Exactly. Um, uh, but um, but what what would you like uh, to be delivered to you for the holiday season in football? Yeah, yeah. And my my one rule when I proposed this was just no Packers, no Vikings. Uh, but other than that, be as be as selfish, be as biased. You know, truly, what do you want? Um. First thing I wrote down was I just want a strong finish for Bryce Young in Carolina. I think last week was probably the the ugliest game he's played. Um, but, you know, the three weeks before that, I didn't think he played like a horrible. And I think that situation is genuinely the worst in the league when you factor in play calling, O-line, receiver play. It's a It's a just complete unmitigated disaster. I just want him to finish strong the last we got four weeks left, right? You know, give me an average of 235 yards, a two to one touchdown interception ratio. Maybe you go two and two just to get all these annoying. Uh, they're calling them the Strouties. Just get the Strouties off his back. We get it. CJ Stroud is better than Bryce Young. If you did a redraft, you'd take CJ Stroud over Bryce Young. It doesn't mean Bryce Young has to go and be out of the league in two years. Like, I want both these quarterbacks to succeed, right? And I'm just, I think Bryce Young gets a lot of hate because of his size. We talked about the importance of surrounding cast earlier. Um, and, you know, I wa I'm watching the Texans this week where they're giving up pressures left and right to the Jets and there's no receivers open. And I'm like, that's true. That's what Bryce Young deals with week in, week out. And I just, I want him to make a case for any potential quality offensive coaches that could help fix this thing. Um, Cause I think if he shows some life um, that's going to be important for their recruiting pitch there. Um, but I want, I want to get the people off his back. The Panthers are only a three point underdog against the Falcons this week. They're a competitive team that just cannot finish games for the most ludicrous reasons. Uh, you watch them against saints this week. They had, uh, I don't know if you caught that game, but shy Tuttle, big free agent signing supposed to be one of the leaders of the defense jumps off sides on a fourth and two in saints territory on one of the most obvious bad, like dummy calls where Derek Carr is just running up to the lines. Like, -ba -da -ba -da -ba -da -ba -da -ba -da and and shy Tuttle goes, Oh, and he jumps off sides with like 15 seconds left on the play clock. It's like, bro, you're a, you're an eight year vet. How did that possibly happen? They had a block punt return for a touchdown. It's not just the offense. They are a complete disaster. I just, for Bryce Young's sake, um, for the people of Charlotte, I just, I want to see the Panthers become a real team in the last month of football. So I was thinking along the same lines here, and this, it doesn't really apply to right now exactly as more into the off season, but somebody do something for Justin Herbert, just to, just something mm. like bring him an off season where they're able to have all those moves that we talk about being great in the off season actually apply because we're going on like three straight years. We're like, Oh, I like their moves. You know, seems like they're on the rise. And then you look at the standings in December and they are five and eight and they have not truly been a competitive team. Uh, they make the playoffs. They blow a massive lead in the first round. Like they really have not been a dangerous team as long as he's been there. And they entirely, just like with Kyler Murray, they just wasted his rookie contract, which is insane mm -hmm. considering how talented Justin Herbert is. So I guess I don't want to wish someone getting fired on uh, anyone or have Santa brings the guy being fired, but something has to change there. So maybe, maybe wishing a, a little bit of change there for the chargers. You, you want a bag we'll of coal right to be direction. delivered to Brandon Staley's desk is what you're saying. I, I just um, feel like it's really harsh to, in the Christmas season to say a coaching change, but also like, do we talk about their management at all? I mean, in this equation, because they haven't been yeah. able to put together a good defense. I do think Telesco is, has dropped the ball in terms of filling out the depth. Like, it, you know, their drafts are about as hit or miss as most, you know, average GMs. But you look at some of their like midseason free agent answers. Like they picked up Isang Bassey, for example, who when the Broncos were on that like historically bad stretch in the first month, 
Isang Bassi was like a big part of it. He was starting in the slot. He missed like six missed tackles in the first four weeks. Couldn't cover anything, you know, an undrafted undersized slot corner. And that was their answer in the slot was, was him when they needed someone. So it's just like some, some of the moves like that. I do have a bit of a brewing take that I said on the pod a couple weeks ago. And I'm curious as you, as you fill out your wish list for the chargers, what about Bill Belichick? What would be your thoughts on that? Because I feel like they have a solid offensive coach. He could be a potential succession plan in like six years, but I still don't know if Kellen Moore is like ready to be a head coach necessarily. And I think that's part of why they haven't fired Staley yet is because then if you promote, you know, you promote Taylor and then he doesn't do a great or uh, Taylor. Did I just have a brain fart moment? Uh, What's the who is Taylor? Is it press? Taylor? Kellen Moore, Kellen Moore, Taylor, sorry. Taylor, 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 Kellen Moore, Lawrence I don't Taylor, know why, Zach Taylor, Taylor, John Taylor, <laughs> Taylor Swift, uh, Taylor Swift. There's your answer. Um, but yeah, Kel- if you promote Kellen Moore is, is who I'm trying to talk about here to head coach now, and things don't go great, you can't then retroactively make him the offensive coordinator. So I think that's part of why um, they're holding on to Staley for now. But yeah, what, what do you think about Belichick to kind of just fix the defense and then have an agreement where like you don't you don't talk about the offense, you don't draft for the offense. If the GM wants a, an offensive lineman or a wide receiver, we have the ability to overstep you. But for the most part, whoever you want on defense, We'll do our best to get them in house for you. What do you think about that uh, arrangement? I would say if the agreement is only for him to coach like two more years, I mean, he it's been such a disaster. It's I mean, so look, I mean, Brady looked pretty old when he was in New England at the end and then goes to Tampa Bay and wins the Super Bowl. So I don't want to say Belichick is totally washed, but if he's going there, he's going to want control over the roster. I don't know that anymore. I would trust him with building a roster that I think I'd prefer them to just kind of clear it out and pick someone that's going to be their coach with that. They could pair with Justin Herbert so they can have this coach quarterback synergy, make it the head coach. I'd probably prefer that. Like I get trying to go and take the big swing because the chargers are just a ball of sadness for so long. I just, man, I like, what has Belichick done in quite some time to convince you that he, I mean, is it since 2016 where it's been great? It really has not been for quite some time. So, uh, well, I guess they were in the Super Bowl in 2017 and lost because of Matt Patricia, but still I, I, that to me, I think Belichick should just walk away. Like it's over, you know, and, and he's done, but I wouldn't be surprised if at some point they, try to take a big swing like that. Uh, I will throw onto my wish list, by the way, just a team to win the Super Bowl who's never won one before. I don't know who. That may be my way of getting around you saying that uh, you, you have to do uh, no Vikings on this list. But anybody, anybody. If you what, about won a Jake, a Super- what about a Jake Browning playoff run? It'd be Is incredible. What? It'd be incredible. Because yeah, that was on would- my list. People would reference it for the rest of time. Yeah. Every time a backup quarterback comes in, hey, Jake Browning. He'd be he'd yep. be the new Trent Dilfer, but a team that's never won it before win the Super Bowl. Yeah, and then the the other one on my list was um, the NFL comes out this week and decides that uh, the NFC South's playoff spot will be going to an eighth wild card spot from the AFC. Okay, that's I don't funny. need to watch that's any funny. of those teams in in a playoff game. I completely. I don't need although, to let me, Rams. Rams could be interesting. Well, yeah, but they're a while. They're a while. Their wild card spot. I'm okay. saying the NFC South, like the four oh, the seed. South. I'm sorry, the South. The four yeah, seed. Sorry. The winner of the, uh, let's just say the winner of the NFC South will will be the five seed in the AFC, and then will push everybody up a spot in the AFC. Yes, I did not process that correctly in my brain. I thought you were saying just like give them an NFC spot because the NFC stinks, but give them specifically the NFC South spot. Hundred yes. percent agree. Uh, I will also wish to Santa Claus Goodell that we take a referee and he can even dress up still if he wants, put him in his little cleats and we put him in a booth with a television feed. And when something is obvious, they call him and they say, referee in the booth. What did you see there? Well, I, uh, you know, I, I saw that it wasn't actually holding pick up the flag. All right. Thanks, Todd. 
pick up the no flag. It wasn't holding. I mean, yeah. everyone at home, everyone at home is watching everything happen. And the guys on the field are the only ones that can't get the help, but I can, I could literally referee a game better because I can see that. Why do we not have people who can see what's going on on the field for the fastest moving game in all of sport? Just, just silliness. So Goodell clause, bring me a booth ref. Yes, please, please. Great call. Uh, All right. One last thing. One last thing this week. We won't run through and draft all of our games as we've done because we've uh, gone on a bit here and I got to run out to uh, cover some Viking stuff. But what is your favorite game of the upcoming week? What's the one you're most excited about? Um, I'm going to, you know, Dallas and Bill, uh, Dallas and Buffalo. Just, you know, I, I'm more curious from the Bills perspective because, you know, they only have so many weeks to sneak into the playoffs, but they're playing really good football. I, I'm curious, like, are they playing at a level that's actually good enough to match these top NFC teams that we've talked about? Cause I think there's a clear gap between the top NFC teams and whatever's going on in the AFC, maybe Baltimore's in that picture, but um, you know, there's no doubt in my mind that the bills are one of the seven best teams in the AFC and they can get hot, but you know, if they come out and like, if their defense plays well this week against Dallas and uh, like they did against Kansas city last week and Josh Allen plays great against this defense um, it's, you know, the hype's going to really start to build, I think for this bills team. And then, and then Dallas, like, you know, can you continue to take care of business? This is the, the tough part of their schedule. They have had a lot of easy games up to this point. Um, but they're starting to win the, the tough games too. So, um, can they continue to, you know, finish this home stretch for the, the NFC East? I'll give you a low key one that I'm very interested in. And that is Chicago at Cleveland. Not mm. just because it's gritty, grimy December football in Cleveland, but Justin Fields been playing pretty well. Mm-hmm. That that Chicago defense, everyone declared Matt Eberflus is Eber fired, and all of a sudden they have had a breath of life. Yep. But is it like a dying animal that rages out right before it's dead, or is it <laughs> like they're actually turning a corner? I, I I'm really curious because if they go into Cleveland and win against a Cleveland team that's pretty tough, I'm gonna be like. Some it's kind of happening with Chicago turning a corner, but if not, then okay. It was fun. Well, it lasted, I guess, for you guys to win a couple of division games. So that's anyway, perfect. this has been fun. We had a good show and, and credit to you other than forgetting Kellen Moore's name after you had said it four times before that you had <laughs> a, a, you had a flu game. You were grinding <laughs> through a, a little bit of a cold here and uh, you were able to still bring a hundred percent content to our listeners. So I appreciate you, man. Well, and a credit to you for hosting the show for, for the first time. Um, maybe, maybe I'll have to pass a couple off to you as, as continue, um, with this great show. Um, as, as anybody that's done this before introing a show is the worst part of the job. And at least in my opinion, (laughs) uh, so you did it on your first take great work. And, uh, thank you everybody for watching and, uh, we'll see you guys next week.